because we are going to get into the book of the Revelation, hopefully. And I want you to understand some things before we look at that. Okay, Revelation chapter 21, uh, verses 1 and 2. Now I saw a new heaven, new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, what we have been doing here is we have been looking at how the Bible talks about time. We looked in First Chronicles how the sons of Issachar were commended for their understanding the times that they were in. Because the Bible, remember, is a history book. It's a chronological history of the world. In Luke chapter 12, as I showed you before, Jesus condemns the, criticizes the leaders of his day for not understanding the time in which they were in. If you listen to chapter 12, verses 54 and following, he said to the multitude, wherever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, shower's coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be a hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. How is it you do not discern this time? This specific Kyrie Ross. Um, so again, Jesus criticizes the people of his day for not knowing not only the time period in which they were involved, but you remember we just celebrated Palm Sunday and Easter. This event in Luke chapter 19 took place on Palm Sunday. And listen to Jesus' uh, confronting them in Luke chapter 19 and verse 44. I believe it is. Yes. Um, he's talking about the, the uh, condemnation that's going to come on Jerusalem, how it's going to be leveled, you and your children within you and the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. We traced back what he was talking about, how he was referring to the prophecy that Daniel talked about in Daniel chapter 9 that began with the decree of, uh, uh, found in Nehemiah chapter 2. If they would have counted the time and would have looked at the time, they would have known that after 483 years, Messiah was to present himself, which is what he did on Palm Sunday. But they didn't get it. They rejected him. And so this is why he's confronting them about this. And so again, the conclusion, Ecclesiastes 3.1, there's a time and a season for everything under the sun. Now when you're looking at the Bible and you're talking about time, there are two words, chronos and kairos. One is a specific time, one is a, a general time. We looked at how we count time or how the Bible counts time prophetically. We looked at that reference in the, the flood in Genesis chapter 7 and 8. In chapter 7 verse 11 of Genesis, the flood began the second month, 17th day of 600th year. The waters prevailed for 150 days, verse 24. When the waters decreased at the end of the 150 days, on the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, 600 years, 30-day months, 30-day months. And so that's how we get our prophetic counting of time. Then we consider some more specific time periods. Were they literally fulfilled or was it an exaggeration? Was it hyperbole? And we saw that all of these, these passages were fulfilled literally. The beginning of the last days was when Jesus came. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. John talks about that in 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. How in these last days, that's the first century, so if you're saying, Jeff, do you think we're in the last days? We've been in the last days, according to the Bible. Okay, uh, We talked and looked at uh, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, how in the fullness of time, at just the right time, Christ came. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. We saw the, of the crucifixion, how many times that Jesus was about to be taken in the Gospel of John. And he said that his time had not yet come, over and over again. We looked also at Luke's reference in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, about the times of the Gentiles, which Jesus referred to, which is the beginning of the Gentile reign. We looked at that and saw that that began in a, 
in a, uh, a specific time period, 586 B.C., with Nebuchadnezzar. We see that it will end in Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 to 45, and Revelation chapter 19, when Christ comes back and takes his, place, his rightful place on the throne of David in the Messianic kingdom. So again, what we're looking at, what we've been looking at, is that there is a chronology of time. There's a time, a specific time, Matthew 8, verses 29, for angels that will be punished. You realize that there are some angels that are permanently bound, there are some that are temporarily bound, and there are some that are loosed. So the Bible gives a chronology of the, all that. Matter of fact, there's a time period referred to, and we looked at it very specifically in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 15, during the judgment times, and again, we'll look at some of that stuff briefly, but in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 15, the Bible says this, So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now is that a literal reference? Are there literally four angels bound right now that will literally be loosed on a specific day, month, and year? I think, I think so, if you take it literally. Otherwise, you, have to, you can make it whatever you want to. So there's, that's a time period that's going to be hell on earth, we'll see. There's the time of the Jews. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, God says that he has cut out a time period in history to accomplish six final things concerning the Jews and Jerusalem. We call that time period the tribulation, or the 70th week of Daniel. We had uh, looked at references to, uh, as to the starting point, the command to restore and rebuild in Nehemiah chapter 2. We saw that after the 483 literal years, Messiah was cut off. Then 37 years after that, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. We saw that the beginning of that last series of seven that Daniel gives begins. It has a beginning point. It has a middle point, and it has an ending. You recall when we were talking about that? The beginning point is when a leader signs a covenant or enforces a covenant with Israel for peace for seven years. In the midst of that, he breaks that deal and then begins persecuting them. In the book of Daniel and Revelation, it divides those two time periods up using the expressions 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, time times dividing of times. Those are literal years. If there are literal years, they're in a chronological order. Any thoughts or questions so far? I'm just kind of bringing you back up to where we're at. This is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. It's referenced in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16 by Jesus, and again by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So there are New Testament references to those, those time periods. Well, you remember in the historical, Zach was saying that it sometimes seems fanciful to think of uh, angels literally coming in and destroying people. You remember in the book of, I think, Kings and Chronicles, it records one angel killing 185,000 men by himself. I don't know if his name was Rambo or what, but I mean, you know, look it up. Did that literally happen or is it a figurative expression? Is it hyperbole? I think it literally happened, right? So... That's a good thought, though. Yeah, it is hard to conceive. Well, remember, there, one of the most dominant subjects in the book of the Revelation are angels, right? Just like the chief cherub, Satan, right? The devil is God's devil, and they know their doom is evident. Angels know that their doom is... So one of the, one of the issues with reading the book of the Revelation... Um, well, I'll just let, uh, I'll let you see it. The book of the Revelation wasn't really dealt with early on. Um, some people didn't even want to hold it to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. This is Martin Luther. I think of it as almost as I do of the fourth book of Ezra, which, which is a, a pseudo-apocryphal book, not inspired, and can in no way detect that the Holy Spirit produced it. It is just the same as if we did not have it, and there are many far better books for us to keep. Finally, let everyone think of it, Revelation, as his own spirit gives him to. 
My spirit cannot find itself into this book. There is, n- there is one sufficient reason for me not to think highly of it. Christ is not taught or known in it. But to teach Christ is the thing which an apostle is bound above all else to do, as he says in Acts 2, in the people's attitude toward the Jewish people. Carrie, yes, Remember, there was no Israel until 1948. There is no Israel. Remember, we talked about that. Israel's been replaced by the church. So you have to understand the context of these men. These men are also breaking off the Catholic church, who still to this day is anti-Semitic. Well, they, here's what you'll hear all the time. You can't read the book of the Revelation because it's apocalyptic literature. It's full of symbols, and you can't understand those. So most people will take an idealistic approach, meaning it's just a hyperbole. It's an exaggeration, which the main thought is good will overcome evil, God will overcome Satan. That's, you're not looking for real history in it, is the thoughts of most people. But as the title suggests, and then I'll get, get you in, the revelation, apocalypsis, of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his bond servants the things which soon should take place, and he sent, communicated by his angel to his bond servant, John. The apocalypsis, the disclosure, the manifestation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. But you can't find that in the book. It's all throughout there. You remember in the Gospels, like Matthew chapter 13, verse 11, the disciples were said to have received the revelation of the mysteries of the kingdom. What was, disclosed, which, what was veiled in the Old Testament has now been revealed. Apocalypsis, the mysteries of the kingdom, was given to them. Paul received direct revelation. Let me give you just a few to help you understand this here. Um, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm not going to try to rush through it. I, I get in a hurry too much. But there's so much information. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now remember, Paul received direct revelation, apocalypsis, of the mysteries or mysterion, things that were unknown in the Old Testament. And in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, It's doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. That's chapter 12 and verse 1. Down in verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, the thorn of the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Just flip over one. They told Jesus, we'd never let that happen to you. You're not going to die. You understand? Like that? Okay. I, I don't know if you're with me or not. I'm trying to gauge where you're at. If you're just not awake, if you're, you know, okay. Paul uses this, this two words together a lot. Revelation, apocalypsis, and mysterion. God had revealed certain things to him that were hidden in the Old Testament. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 3 and 9, he talks about how the church, the one man, the one new man, Jew and Gentile, was a mystery in the Old Testament. And the Jews always thought they were the chosen superior people. And Gentiles were not able to be saved. Or Samaritans. That's why they wouldn't go through Samaria even when they were up in Galilee. They would go around it. Right? Right? Paul also talked about another mystery concerning the church, the, what we call the, or what I refer to as the harpazo. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and following. Remember, behold, I show you a mystery. In other words, they didn't know about that. They knew about resurrection in the Old Testament. They didn't know about translation or instant glorification. Paul said, we should not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Jesus said, when that happens, I'm going to take you to my father's house. Right? The harpods of the snatching out. When did you have something? Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, so we're on number two then. Number one, what is the title? The revelation or the unveiling of Yeshua, of Jesus. Right? Who wrote it? John, the bondservant of Jesus. Um, within what we call the 
Johannian corpus, Johannian, um, uh, within John's writings, uh, within this book, the book of the Revelation, he's named as the author five different times, and I've given you the references there. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 4 and 9 and, and so forth. You can see those. John wrote five of our, the New Testament books that we have. Remember? The Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of the Revelation. So he's contributed quite a bit to us. This one, this revelation, it's not revelations, it's revelation is a single vision that he receives. It's one mystery. Chapter 1 and verse 20, I think he uh, uses that term. If I can find it very quickly here. The mystery, yes, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Amazing. The symbols are identified for us. And you know what you'll find just about every time when you go through here, he will identify what the symbols mean. Or if you know your Old Testament, which I showed you that, that, that chart that I have of all those passages concerning the Old Testament, and I'll, I'll show you one, Revelation 11. If you know what he's talking about, you can figure out uh, if you can figure out what he's talking about by the Old Testament reference, the, the vision is made clear. You don't have to guess what it is. See, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that eventually. I'll use that one because that's a pretty interesting one. So a mystery is something that's concealed in the Old Testament, uh, which it literally means to shut the mouth, but it's now been revealed. So where was this written from? It's written from Patmos, a little island, Right? And I got a quote for you there out of some of the historical writings. Note the quote that I have for you down there out of the Ecclesiastical Histories of Eusebius. And they even indicated the time accurately, relating that in the 15th year of Domitian, Flava Domitilla, who was the niece of Flavius Clemens, one of the many consuls at Rome at that time was banished with many others to the Isle of Pontia as testimony to Christ. What, what they're demonstrating here is that that's how Domitian shut them up. You know, if we keep killing these people, we're making them martyrs. It's better left to just banish them and silence them that way. Uh, notice the quote down there below uh, from Tertullian's The Prescription Against Heresies. Uh, he talks about where John the Apostle was first plunged, unheard, in boiling oil, and thence remitted to his island exile. Patmos is an island off the coast of Asia Minor in the Aegean Sea, and you can see it in that outline there. Right? Any thoughts or questions so far? Easy going? See? You're making it through the book of the Revelation, all right? You're, you're two points ahead of me. But yes, y yes, though, yes. Uh, Dave made a reference to the, the dating of the book of the Revelation when it was written because this is a big issue. How many understand why it's a big issue? Like three of you. All right, okay, I'll tell you why in a minute. So to whom was it written? The seven churches, seven literal churches in Asia Minor. Okay, now look at the big... Uh, elephant in the room not me number five when it was written when it was written AD 95 AD 95 is the, the date that is given 95 96 here is a man I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with him Irenaeus Okay, Jesus was born BC, uh, 6 B.C. to 33 A.D. After him, John, the beloved disciple, you know, from 6 A.D. to 100. John, the disciple, has a, a uh, disciple of his own from 69 to, who lived from 69 to 155 by the name of, starts with a poly, Polycarp. Polycarp had a disciple who he mentored by the name of 
Irenaeus. And here is what Irenaeus wrote during his time. In his Against Heresies, but if it had been necessary to announce his name plainly at the present time, it would have been spoken by him who saw the apocalypse. What's the word apocalypse? The revelation. Who wrote the revelation? John. For it was not seen long ago, but almost in our own time at the end of the reign of Domitian. This is external evidence for the dating of Revelation. You can look at other internal evidence, such as uh, in um, Revelation 3.17, talks about the Laodicean church being rich, yet uh, we know that there, uh, it had been leveled by an earthquake in the early 60s. Again, the reason this is important is because some hold what we call, and we've talked about this, a preterist view, which means Revelation 6 to 19 has been fulfilled before A.D. 70. And what Dave was saying was, it, that's, that's the basis of their teaching. If, if that book, the book of Revelation, is not written before A.D. 70, everything else falls apart. So they have to secure that date. All right? This is a quote from uh, Dr. Sproul, R.C. Sproul, a partial preterist. You see that on your outline. The burden for preterists, then, is to demonstrate that Revelation was written before A.D. 70, page 140. That book is in our library. I would not suggest you read it. it that's me. I know other people enjoyed it and give it to other people. I really didn't like it at all uh, because I don't agree with that view at all. Uh, but that's me. So if you want to read that, I think there's a copy in the, the library that we have over there. Or if you just want to borrow it and read it, I'll give you mine. You could keep it, actually. But I love R.C. Sproul. I have his study Bible. I have tons of his tapes, tons of his books. There's a lot of things that I just, he's so great on salvation, pneumatology. But when it gets to ecclesiology, baptizing babies, and eschatology, that's where I, I part with with him all right so AD 95 96 has been the traditional date for over 19 about 1900 years of church history and that debt that AD 70 date that pre AD 70 date uh, is essential to the preterist viewpoint okay that's just for your information if you want to study preterism partial preterism and all that knock yourself out all right so how it's organized any thoughts or questions on that now's the time to speak if you want to dispute the timing. Yeah, Zach? It ended in, I think, around 96, something like that. No. Nero was reigning in the 60s, who they say is Antichrist, preteris. Right? By the way, those time periods, 1,260 days, 42 months, seven-year you have to spiritualize them. They can't be literal in that scheme of thing. It's hyperbole. So when you try to find, when we, I showed you all those things that are happening in Revelation chapter 6 through 19 with the trumpets and the bulls, though you're not looking for those to have happened or to happen literally. It's, a, it's an exaggeration of things that happened during that time period. So you get a little bit of a historicism viewpoint, right? This is the fulfillment of that. 1948 came and a lot of people went up. Now what? Just like with the post-millennial, we're bringing in the kingdom. And then World War I hits. Oh, now what? It's not getting better. Then World War II. Oh, let's step back and try to see this a different way. All right. All right. Again, how is it organized? The outline. Three-part outline. I want to show you. Look at, uh, and I'll show you somewhere else this is done. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall be my witnesses. Finish it. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the earth, right? There's an expansion there. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. So he had his right hand, seven stars. This is verse 16. My glasses aren't working. Here we are. Verse 19. Write the things which you have seen. And what did he see in chapter 1? The risen Christ. The things which are to the churches and the things which shall be 
hereafter. There's your three-point outline. And you can see that little reference that I gave you with that expression that you'll see in verse 19, the things after, after these things, metatata. You'll see it again in chapter 4, verse 1, after these things. So I would outline it like this. You have before the tribulation in chapters 4 and 5 up in heaven. You have during the tribulation and then after these things. You have the tribulation period itself in 6 through 19. After that, the millennial reign of Christ, Revelation chapter 20 through 22, or Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 10. And you have the great white throne judgment, which follows that. In 11 through 15, you have the destruction of the present heavens and present earth. And then you have the recreation and the new heavens and the new earth. A chronological flow. That seems to make more sense to me. Then saying, as the full preterist would, we are now in the new heavens and the new earth. The church is the new heavens and the new earth. So you've just abandoned any literal interpretation. Okay? Now, if you, if you don't think that I'm representing that viewpoint correctly, just say something, because I'm, I'm trying to give you, I'll give you more information, more quotes from uh, these viewpoints. But you can do it, I mean, if you want to. You can do that. Right? So this is how I see uh, it organized. Now again, when th there are several viewpoints, the preterist viewpoint, the futuristic, the historic, the idealistic, and then what we call the, uh, uh, what's that word starts with the E, Andrew? Eclectic, which is a combination of the strengths of all of these and a dismissal of their weaknesses. Right? So you have five different viewpoints. Most people that are doing Revelation will take an idealistic viewpoint. They just give you practical applications. They're not going to deal with anything historic. Okay? Any thoughts or questions? Comments? Well, I know you guys have comments. I have no idea. Um, if you have if you're talking like Catholic Church, Presbyterian Church, Lutheran Church, Methodist Church, you're talking more of the amillennialist, uh, postmillennialist, more of the preterist type, right? Uh, if you go with the, more of the current evangelical churches, depending on how strong the uh, Reformed influence is on them, they would probably be mostly, I'm guessing, the, the premillennialists. Now, whether they're pre-trib or not, I don't know, but it would, I think premillennialism would be a dominant view. These are some of the men, uh, for your information. You might know some, some of them. Um, you know, you have historic premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism, which is people like David Jeremiah, MacArthur, Pentecost, Charles Ryrie, and so forth. You have postmillennialism, which is people like Jonathan Edwards, uh, B.B. Warfield, Lorraine Botner, John Calvin, Kenneth Gentry, those people. Remember, again, they just came out of the Great Awakenings, right? There were Wesleyan, Whitfield revivals, people were being saved, um, bars were being closed down. So they thought they were bringing in the kingdom. And then the wars hit, Right? And then you have amillennialism, Augustine or Augustine, J.I. Packer, who I love, R.C. Sproul, who I love, Anthony Hakama, Sam Storms, Calvin, Gerhardus Voss, all those men, tremendous writers, thinkers. But just so if you see those names, you can know where they're at as far as their understanding of eschatology. Yeah. All right? So how it was delivered, you see this in verse um, 1, chapter 1 of Revelation, verses 1, 11, and 2, 1. It's a sevenfold, and I, I uh, lost this when I was teaching this to the, in, in the academy, but I, I figured out where I made my mis mistake. You'll see several people involved here. You have Jesus, God the Father, the angel sent. You have John. You have the things that John saw written in a book. You have the seven churches, and then you have this angel of the church. 
Now, that angel of the church is interesting because the Greek word angelos simply means messenger. So is it a, a, an angel, literally spirit angel to that church, or is it the messenger of that church? John the Baptist is referred to as an angelos in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, verse 10, I think. All right? Somewhere around in there. Any thoughts? There's tons of angels mentioned. Yes. Yes. Not unless they uh, wreck their bike. And <laughs> it's... Uh, All right. So why was it written? Why was the book of the Revelation written? For encouragement and holiness, right? These churches were experiencing a rough time, and what was to come was going to be nothing but judgments. Remember all of these things, and I'll show you uh, an overview of it. The seal, the trumpet, the bowls are happening in a seven-year period, if it's literal, which I think it's literal. But if it's a literal time period, these things happen in rapid-fire succession. Okay, so number nine, what is it about? The unveiling of the final phase of Jesus' redemptive program. Remember Christ's ultimate victory over the evil provides comfort to the Christians of all ages as well as stimulates holy living because when God fulfills his covenants with Israel, he will gain victory over evil as well as punish it. Remember, if you're taking those literal covenant those covenants as literal fulfillments this is when those covenants will be fulfilled the abrahamic land davidic and new covenants are all unilateral that means god obligated himself to fulfill the covenants it wasn't conditioned on israel's obedience so if those covenants fail god failed see that where the opposition likes to say God put Israel away, divorced Israel when they crucified their Messiah. But as I read to you several times already in Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37, God said, I, Israel will never cease from being a nation and I will never cast them off. They will always be my, peop my people uh, while, the, while the elements, the sun and the moon and the stars exist. You can't do away with his people. They're the apple of his eye, as he says in Zechariah. Right? So what makes this book different? Well, it's the only book that has what? You all know this. Blessing to those who read it and heed it. Then why aren't we reading it? Why aren't we teaching it if it's the only book that offers a blessing? There's several times in there that uh, blessings are, are uh, given. Blessing upon the reader and heater. Blessing upon the tribulation martyrs. Blessing upon the spiritually prepared, so on and so forth. Right? So let me see if I can't give you what I think is a, a good chron uh, chronology. Uh, this is by Lewis Ferry Schaefer. He's the founder of um, Dallas Theological Seminary. We just finished doing the Millennial Kingdom, Revelation chapter 20. You go through verses 1 through 10. Afterwards, then, you pick up in verse... Uh, 10 or 7 through 6 you pick up in verses 7 through 10 then the least the release of satan from the abyss you have the revolt on earth with the judgments upon satan and his armies the passing of the old heaven and earth the great white throne judgment the creation of the new heaven and new earth the descent of the bridal city from god out of heaven and the surrender then of the mediatorial aspect of christ's reign and adjustment to the eternal state immediately following now, to me, even though I read that literally, I think that's the chronology of it. So somebody who doesn't believe that, give me what you think. Or another viewpoint of that. Anybody? Anybody? You guys are awful quiet. 
All right, we'll look at your other outline then, the structure of Revelation. Are you just processing this, or you agree? Oh. Let me help you with something that's uh, kind of confusing to people. There are five non-chronological parenthetical insertions. Remember like Genesis 1 and 2, you have the account, and then, you, then uh, Moses goes back and gives details. John does the same thing. He gives several accounts, and then he'll stop and go back and, and, and flesh out some of the details. So you have five sections. So if you were looking at them this way, you would see the seal judgments. Out of the seventh seal comes the first trumpet, obviously, which is Revelation 10 through 11. There's no more delay. The two Jewish witnesses. You have the 144,000 Jews, which some say are witnesses there. Out of that seventh trumpet, you have the first bull, and you have then that other section, Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 through 16, which gets into the details about the, uh, how the nations of the world are gathered to Armageddon. After that, in Revelation 17 and 18, you have Babylon fallen. So you have breaks within the chronology, five breaks within the chronology, right? So look at your structure then, and we'll get some of these get some of these done. So there are four major principles that define the structure of Revelation that shows it to be both chronology, chronological and sequential. Right? And if it is, then it's literal. It's a, a pis, epistolary nature. And that's just a fancy word uh, for saying that it has a beginning, a middle, and an ending. Like a letter. A prologue uh, or a beginning in Revelation 1, 1 through 8. It contains seven exhortations to seven churches in, in Asia Minor, right? Are there, there are seven literal churches in literal Asia Minor, and it ends with the epilogue in chapter 22, verses 6 through 21, or it has the conclusion. See that? Apocalyptic literature, non-inspired apocalyptic literature, does not have this, okay? It's structured in three parts, by three time periods, as we said. The things that he had seen, the things that are, and the things that will be hereafter. Or menetato, after these things. There's a sequence that he uses, a term. And you can see that then in number three. It's sequential nature. The sequential nature of the sevenfold judgments. You have the first six seals, seven seals broken. Out of that, the first trumpet. By the way, notice that you'll see later on those, those seals are important, what comes out of them as well. Then you have the trumpets, one through six. Out of the seventh trumpet comes the first bull, and then a continuation to the seventh. So you see the sequential wording as well, John uses. And I saw, after this, I saw. Just like 119, after this, after these things, I saw. Then chapter 4, verse 1, after these things, the church is then, I saw this. So you can see that sequential nature there and his wording. Uh, you can go back later and study, this is number 5, you can go back later and study the, its contextual connection with the synoptic eschatological passages. Remember Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the, the synoptic gospels, gospels that are like, I've given you those references, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. You can compare them with Revelation 6 through 19 and that 70th week of Daniel, and they all harmonize. They all harmonize. And again, it's progressive, right? And then you can see that theme that runs through there. That's your point under there. The birth pains, that phrase that's used in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Revelation 6, Paul uses that phrase as well. And then I don't know how many of you are familiar with this thought, but you can also note that God's fourfold means of his covenant wrath against his covenant people. How many of you are familiar with that? I know some of you are. Ezekiel chapter 14. Let me just show you this real quick. Ezekiel chapter 14, if you... We'll turn there. 
He uses this term all throughout. He sends famine in verse 13. He sends wild beasts in 15. He brings a sword in verse 17. He brings pestilence in verse 19. You can see this all through the references I gave you in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah and in Leviticus, and in Leviticus 26, which is, remember, the, the uh, blessing and cursings. If, if you don't obey, this is how I will punish you. Right? Listen to what he says here in Ezekiel 14, verse 21. For thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword, famine, beast, pestilence. It's consistent. Now you can spiritualize that, allegorize that, say it's hyperbole, but it, he consistently uses these. And in Revelation chapter 6, what do you have? You have the, what I believe is the Antichrist in 6.1, followed by war, famine, beast, death. And you have that all throughout. You have it all throughout. So God's fourfold covenant wrath that he brings against his people, Israel. Now, why is that? Well, to break their pride. You can see the references there. Leviticus 26, 19, Daniel 12, 7. That's one of the purposes of the tribulation period, of Daniel's um, time period. Also to accomplish those six things, so to fulfill prophecy. Also, if you read Revelation chapter 7, when the multitude is standing there, and the angel asks John, who are these? He says, I don't know, you know. He said, these are those who came out of great tribulation. It'll bring a worldwide revival, another thing that will happen during this tri tribulation period. And then this, and here's one that I, I do want to read. Um, the other uh, purpose of the tribulation is to weed out all unbelievers for the kingdom, all right? Revel, uh, Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 9, listen to what's said here. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, um, with both wrath and fierce anger, delay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. Second Thessalonians chapter uh, 1, I believe it is, talks about Jesus coming in, in flaming fire to wreak vengeance on those who persecute his people. If you look in Ezekiel, over a few books, Ezekiel chapter 20, you see the same thing in verses 30 to 38 of Ezekiel chapter 20. In verse 38, he said, I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. God is going to weed out all rebels so that only those who are saved, for lack of a better term, go into the Messianic kingdom. You'll see the same thing, Psalm 104, verse 35, Matthew 25, uh, verses 32 to 33, and 41 and 46, he has two groups, the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. The sheep go into the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world, the goats go into eternal fire. There's only two groups. What happens to the other group? Well, if you read the Old Testament, they go into the lake of fire, or the, into hell, awaiting that final judgment. Only saved go into the millennial kingdom if you take it literally. Now, I know some don't agree with that chronology. And they believe that this happens after the thousand years. But Christ is ruling already. He's come to sit on the throne of his glory to rule. And we looked at those millennial passages last week. All right. Any thoughts? Yeah. You have to, yeah. That's where they would come from. Do you understand this question? There's going to be people in their natural bodies. And remember we, when we studied the kingdom, who will be there last week? There will be glorified saints and there will be people in their natural bodies. Because they're going to have children who will have to bow the knee to Christ willingly. Accept him or not. And as you know, at the end of the book of the Revelation, chapter 20, verses 7 through 10, there's a rebellion when Satan's re released. Remember this. Isaiah 65 says life will be, if a person dies at the age of 100, it'll be like a premature death. 
So you have no Satan, no evil, no devils, no death. And kids are being raised up in that perfect environment. They don't know what death is. Right? And that could lead into a lot of other things as to why other stuff is done, but my time's up. Any other thoughts? Now, how, so they would, be right, they would be considered righteous then, right? Because that's, what the, the, that's the terms that he uses here in Matthew um, chapter 25. The righteous will enter, and the unrighteous will not. 